All right. You're going to have to hear me now. I'm going to make sure the microphone works well. Let's pray, please. Join me in prayer. We thank you, God, once again for inviting us to this new life. We thank you so much because it doesn't all depend on us. It is by your spirit, by your presence, that we can come and be and do. And so we ask that this morning your presence will ignite that fire again within us so that your new creation in us can bring good news to the people around us. In Christ's name we all pray. Amen. Before I was ordained as a pastor now a few years back, um, one of the requirements that I had to do in order to be ordained coming from the Virginia Conference was that I had to do a unit of what they call clinical pastoral education or uh, as other call it CPE or as some of my friends calls it, uh, booth camp for pastors. Um, there are a lot of variations of CPE. One is that basically on top of the, your work that you do at the church while you're serving a church, uh, you, have the, you have to basically add an average of 20 hours, extra 20 hours to your work schedule. And you have to do an internship um, either at a hospital, uh, a prison, um, any sort of special institution that needs pastoral care. Uh, retirement home and uh, certainly it, it is a very formative experience because you get a chance to not just serve people in particular settings as the hospital or the prison or a retirement home but also because uh, there is supervision you get a supervisor who's uh, in a group with you with other pastors who are doing the same trying to train you in the art of uh, being a better pastor to provide love and care and at the same time psychoanalyze you. It's a very interesting experience to say the least. Needless to say, when it came the point for me to do that, I uh, was able to do my CPE at a place called the Goodwin House. It's a retirement home in Northern Virginia in Alexandria. And a uh, wonderful place, Episcopal place, uh, a wonderful retirement home. It was like the Hilton for people retiring. It's super nice, super expensive, wonderful. And uh, among the many things I had to do besides going to visit people, uh, praying for them, and doing chapel once a week with the other pastors, at least every other week, I was in charge of leading a service for the Alzheimer's unit. Every other week on Friday mornings, I'll have a chance to go and lead the Alzheimer's unit or the dementia unit uh, in praying, singing hymns, and to preach a very short sermon. Um, so every week, you never, I never knew what I was going to encounter, to be quite honest. And uh, not only because of the reactions of the people, uh, but also because every week you will have either new people coming in or people who were there who were no longer there. But there was something that really stuck with me out of doing that work in that unit. You know, I would be, I would be, uh, we would be reading scriptures and we would be just, I would be talking, introducing myself, good morning, how are you? And you know, people seem to be somewhere else. Then we would begin to sing. And the same people who could not know their name, the same people who didn't remember who were their family members, the same people who, again, didn't know where they were in that particular moment, as soon as we began to sing those hymns, they sang every word of those hymns with such a love and such a passion that it was just astonishing. Not only that, when we would come to the time of praying the, the Lord's Prayer, again, you know, they will take a nap while I was preaching. Then we will do the Lord's Prayer, and they will come back to life. This happened every time I went to that unit. 
Sometimes it was different people. Sometimes it was all of them. Sometimes it was just one of them. And when I was experiencing those moments, what in my head was just something that I needed to do in order to get ordained, a requirement that I needed to fulfill, I began to realize that I was in the presence of a holy moment. I was in the presence of a God moment where I got to see or I got to experience the power of God in the lives of those wonderful men and women who no matter what they were going through, they remember how much God loved them. I don't know if you had had any of those moments, maybe not lately, but in general in your life. When you have those moments when you think you're just doing something else, when you think you're just going to do a requirement, when you're just fulfilling your uh, obligations, and suddenly, out of nowhere, you have this God moment, this moment when you feel that you're standing on holy ground, this moment where it might have been a, a prayer answered, or a word that you needed to hear, or a miracle that you needed to, that you experienced unexpectedly when everything was lost. It could be something big, it could be something small. But I'm almost sure that you have experienced those holy God moments that come out of nowhere to, to make, make us aware that God does love us and God does change lives. As we heard this morning in the Old Testament and the Hebrew scripture, um, we find the people of God in the year 742 uh, BCE. What we find is that the people of God have lost a king who had uh, governed them for 42 years. As with any politician, this was a mixed bag. There were a lot of good things that he did, and there were some other things that were not that good. But to be a king for 42 years, it either takes a, a lot of... Uh, skill, political skills, or you are a dictator, or you might be some, doing something good. I think that King Uzziah was a mix of all of those things. But he got to the point where his head got so big that he began to, to mess with the worship of God and the temple. Needless to say, King Uzziah died. And so now the people of God find themselves in this very awkward uh, transitional time where there is this huge vacuum created by the absence of the king who in some ways was loved but also not really liked. And the people of God are trying to see what's going to happen next. Who's going to come next? Are we going to go back to the way things were before? Are things going to get better? Are things going to get worse? What's going to happen now? And so uh, the prophet Isaiah then Although it doesn't, the, the scripture doesn't tell us that there was a funeral service, it tells us that the prophet Isaiah is at the temple praying, seeking God's direction. Certainly he probably was grieving, certainly he was afraid, certainly he was just expecting what is going to happen next. And as he's in the temple, worshiping God, praying in the temple, something unexpected happened. God showed up. God showed up in a very powerful way. The God Yahweh showed up, and it says that the edges of God's robe fill the entire temple. Not only that, but he also sees this six, uh, these creatures with six wings. In the scripture this morning, I think they were called angels, but the actual word for this kind of creature is a seraph. And the name seraph, it's a very interesting word because it comes from a root meaning burning or fiery. And these seraphs are the hairs of this uh, long Middle Eastern tradition of great flaming monsters who lived up there, somewhere up there, and were poised to come and destroy everything with God's wrath. So you can imagine how Isaiah was feeling when he saw the seraphs. I just went to see the movie Jurassic Park. And I can imagine just seeing those monsters as if it was a dinosaur in front of me. And Isaiah is panicking, certainly. Because again, these fiery people 
most of the times are here not to bring good news, but bad news. But not this time, because the seraphs were here on behalf of God to serve God, not to kill people. They came to bring a mission to the prophet Isaiah. Again, this is a very dramatic scene. The temple is shaking, the foundations of the temple are shaking, and then something really strange happens. Isaiah feels so overwhelmed by this amazing moment that the first words out of his mouth are, I am a sinner. Why am I here? I don't deserve anything that I'm experiencing that you have given me, God. Too often, I think that we miss this part of our relationship with God. Certainly, we recognize it until it's forced upon us, this reality, that we are all here because the church is not a place for the good people necessarily, but it's a hospital for the people in need. It's a hospital for the people who are sick and need God. And sometimes we miss that part. But here I say it doesn't have a choice. He feels inadequate to receive whatever he is about to experience from God. Yet it is precisely this, this moment of this realization that will give Isaiah the possibility of doing something great for God. Then, again, as I mentioned earlier, something really weird happens. These creatures take a coal, a burning coal, and they put it to touch the lips of Isaiah. I don't know how you feel about putting a coal in your mouth, but I'm sure it, it, it was painful. I'm sure that it was a little bit interesting or awkward, just to say the least, to have that coal in your mouth. But what was happening in this moment is that God was purifying Isaiah's lips because from that moment on, Isaiah was called to speak not just on behalf of God, but to be inspired by God, by that love from God, to do God's work. The fire in Isaiah ignited in him a power so that he would go into his country and his people. In this moment of transitional leadership, in this moment when people were very anxious about the changes, in this moment when people didn't know where to turn, when people were frustrated because of the old leadership, who's going to be the new leadership, who's going to come behind us, who's going to make things better, are we going to go back to our old ways? Is anything going to change? And God just gave Isaiah the fire to assure the people of God that things will not be the same and that God was not done with them and that God was going to transform the earth through Isaiah's words. But here's again the point that I think we, I don't want us to miss. N.T. Wright, biblical scholar, said, God is putting the world right. So God puts people right. So that they might be his right putting people. In order for the world to change, in order for the church to change, you and I need to be right with God. We need to be forgiven. We need to forgive. And we need to open our hearts to whatever God is going to do now. And today, God is appearing once again to all of us this morning. God is grabbing that fiery coal 
and is ready to place it on our lips. But we have to be willing, like Isaiah, to be put, put right before God. You might be here in church today because you are here. But this might be a holy moment for you and for me. The good news this morning is that God's Holy Spirit is inviting us to transform this world. And I hope that before we point our fingers at the people who are wrong or the institutions that are wrong, that we will first begin with us so that God's fire will truly change the world. Amen.